ladies and gentlemen, to um, uh, what I think will be one of the most interesting sessions of the conference. It's my honor to be able to introduce, or rather to reintroduce uh, Dr. James Bullard, who is, as most of you know, um, a member of the Federal Open Market Committee, as well as the uh, President and CEO of the St. Louis Fed. Um, he was on this podium yesterday uh, with Grant Spencer and Glenn Stevens answering uh, questions, and we learned that like the proverbial leopard, he, he did not change his dots uh, at, <laughs> at the last uh, FOMC meeting. Dr. Bullard is going to talk to us today uh, about international policy coordination uh, rather than the outlook for US monetary policy, but there will be plenty of time for Q&A, and I, I suspect we might get the odd question on US monetary policy. Um, since we heard uh, the long introduction yesterday, I won't say very much more except to uh, say that um, um, uh, your reputation, I think, is for being one of the most interesting, thoughtful, uh, and well-informed of the uh, members of the FOMC. There's always uh, a strong academic uh, background to uh, the formation of policy views. Um, and today's talk, I think, uh, uh, will be fascinating in and of itself. Um, and we look forward to it very much. Thank you. Well, I, I appreciate I appreciate the opportunity to be here. So please. OK, I will. <clears throat> Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm looking forward to our session here. Um, uh, I am going to talk about international uh, monetary policy coordination, but I'm happy to take questions on all kinds of uh, topics. But hopefully, um, we can uh, uh, put out this, uh, this idea that there's two different views of international policy cooperation. Um, and you know, maybe as usual, my views are probably a little bit different from uh, from many that you might hear about. So uh, I, I hope you find this uh, interesting. This is the introduction slide. <laughs> so should monetary policy be better coordinated across countries? This is a classic question in macroeconomics. And in recent years, this question has moved back to center stage. I think it was a little bit dormant, uh, maybe during the 90s and the 2000s, but it's come back uh, to center stage. And it's mainly because I think of unconventional policy in the US, and that's been met from with a lot of criticism, maybe some of it coming from uh, people sitting in this very room. And I think this uh, taper tantrum from last summer re-energized the debate on international policy coordination. So uh, I was at Jackson Hole uh, last summer, and pretty much the whole Jackson Hole was all about uh, emerging market uh, criticism of FOMC policy. So what happened uh, during this taper tantrum in the summer of 19, or 2013? <clears throat> US interest rates uh, went up. Uh, fairly substantially and in a surprising way. Emerging market currencies depreciated against the US dollar. Capital flowed out of emerging markets and toward uh, the US. And emerging market equity prices declined. So this is all, probably all searingly familiar to, uh, to many of you uh, in this room. So here's the long -term, uh, longer term interest rates in the US. This is the US 10 year uh, Treasury from May of 2013 through uh, August, September 2013. And it goes up about uh, you know, roughly 100 basis points, uh, depending on exactly uh, what uh, day you go from and to. And here are some emerging market uh, currencies. We put quite a few on this chart. Uh, depreciation is up in the chart, and uh, basically, you know, almost everything depreciated uh, against the U.S. dollar. Sometimes people say, "Well, you know, some emerging markets are better prepared, and then others." So, so that this issue is just one for certain countries that aren't well prepared for this kind of thing. But if you look at this picture, it's kind of like, "Well, uh, 
looks like everyone pretty much got uh, hit in the same way. Uh, here's the emerging market uh, capital inflows. Uh, this chart goes from January of 2012 out through October of 2013. The vertical line on the right of this chart is the Bernanke testimony from last spring where uh, Chairman Bernanke said that uh, he thought we could start reducing the pace of asset purchases, quote, in the next few meetings. He said that in May, thinking, uh, you know, maybe June, maybe August, maybe September. And uh, so that was a surprise for markets, and these flows uh, reversed and, and went the other way. So, um, this also splits between uh, emerging Asia, the blue there, and Latin America, the gold. And then uh, emerging market stock indexes uh, dropped. Uh, and so this, again, shows a wide array of, uh, of countries. And again, uh, you know, the story that some countries maybe were more insulated than others, well, maybe. But basically, you got a pretty broad swath of emerging markets. They are all kind of hit in the same way by this taper tantrum. So just looking at these pictures and trying to evaluate this, how should we think about uh, this taper tantrum, and how should we think about these developments with respect to emerging markets vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Uh, on the dimensions I showed you. So there is a traditional view, uh, which you're, we're all quite familiar with, but I'm going to talk about anyway, uh, which is that this is merely the global macroeconomic equilibrium in action. And I'm going to spend a ton of time on that. And then I'm going to present a more radical and less widely accepted view that this kind, the kinds of pictures I just showed you represent unnecessary volatility in the global uh, economy. And so the basic, the whole point of the talk is just to talk about these two possible views and see what you think about them. <clears throat> so I'm first going to describe the traditional view. And in the traditional view, the gains from international policy coordination are small. My description is going to be similar to a speech recently given by John Taylor, Stanford University. He gave this at the Bank for International Settlements in December of 2013. And I'll actually have a slide later that contrasts what I'm saying with what John is saying. And then I'm going to turn to an alternative view. And in the alternative view, uh, worldwide ec equilibrium may be unnecessarily volatile due, due to US policy. And the story is that maybe that alternative view better describes the perspective from emerging markets and maybe some of you uh, in this room. So since I'm a US policymaker, I'm going to endorse the first view. <laughs> but since you're emerging markets, guys, you can endorse the second view if you want. So let's first start with this uh, conventional wisdom. And I think we're all pretty familiar with it. But I want to lay it out my way, and then when I get to the alternative view, I'll be able to just make one change to get to the alternative view. So if you want to get to the academic literature that uh, reflects a traditional view, you might read uh, Obstfeld and Rogoff in the QJE, or you might read Clarita Gali and Gertler in the Journal of Monetary Economics from uh, early in the 2000s. These are kind of the, uh, the, the, the kinds of papers I have in mind. There's a much broader literature but these are the kinds of papers that I'm talking about today. <clears throat> and let me just describe what these uh, papers do. We're not going to do anything technical here, but I'll just give you broad brush uh, description. So the way the world works in this traditional view is there are a whole bunch of economies. They are all new Keynesian economies. This means that everything works fine in this economy, except that there are sticky prices. And because there are sticky prices, there's a role for monetary policy. But other than that, everything works uh, fine. Capital is mobile internationally. Uh, exchange rates are perfectly flexible. So I'm already I'm ticking off things that aren't true. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is the way this view works. <clears throat> um, and then because of the sticky price problem, there's independent and the flexible exchange rates, there's, there's independent monetary policy in each of these countries, a whole bunch of them. Each of them has independent monetary policy. And let's just think of that independent monetary policy as characterized by some kind of Taylor type policy rule, some kind of adjustment of nominal interest rates in reaction to output gaps and inflation gaps. 
And then uh, there's a clear description in this literature of what is good policy. Good policy is something where you obey the Taylor Principle. And the Taylor Principle is very simple. You got to raise nominal interest, or you got to change nominal interest rates more than one for one in reaction to deviations of inflation from target. So inflation moves a little bit above your target. Nominal interest rates have to go up more than one for one. If inflation moves below target, nominal interest rates have to come down more for, than one for one. If the policymaker follows that kind of a policy, then you get a nice stable situation and you drive the economy back toward uh, steady state uh, equilibrium. So these shocks are occurring in this model at the country level. And then the policymaker is moving nominal interest rates around in reaction to shocks. And this is how the equilibrium works. So this is a foundation of monetary policy that's been developed in the last 20 or 25 years. <clears throat> so what do you get out of this kind of a uh, concept? I mean, there's all kinds of things you could say about these assumptions. You could say, well, okay, maybe capital's not really mobile. Maybe exchange rates aren't perfectly flexible, all kinds of things. We're not going to say any of those things. We're going to take this hook, line, and sinker. OK, so you take this world, and you say, well, what do you get out of this world? Well, if the policymakers follow good policy, that is, they obey the Taylor principle, and they focus only on uh, domestic variables, domestic output gaps, and domestic inflation gaps when they're making monetary policy, you get a couple of nice results. You get a nice global equilibrium. This global equilibrium is unique. There's only one of them. And you also get a result that says the payoff to international policy coordination is small. The payoff to international policy coordination is small. So what do we mean by that? What are these small gains to international policy uh, cooperation? Well, what happens in the models is that, you know, I've got some shocks hitting my economy. You've got shocks hitting your economy. Um, if I took into account the level of uh, the effect of foreign activity on the domestic marginal cost of production, maybe I could do a little bit better. And just to be concrete about it, what the, what the literature says is that for me, as a US policymaker, what I should be doing is taking account of the deviation of foreign inflation from the foreign inflation target. And that would, I would take account of that when I'm setting my interest rate rule, or writing down my interest rate rule. And I would get a better outcome in the US for my guys in the US. So there could be some gains to international policy cooperation. And just to be concrete, it would mean every central bank is taking into account uh, the inflation developments in all the other countries when they're setting their own home monetary policy. Well, you could do that, and you would get a little bit better outcome. But you do almost as well just ignoring that and paying attention only to domestic variables. So the gains are small. So that's the nature of these findings from, uh, from, these, from this literature. So many have concluded, maybe including some of you maybe, that uh, if you think this way about how the global economy works, it just doesn't pay to worry about international monetary policy uh, cooperation. It would, the gains that you would get from it would be small. There would be sort of some risk-sharing gains across countries from the fact that you know, uh, there are different shocks hitting the different countries. But those gains would not be large. And anyway, it would be hard to get all the policymakers around the world to actually play this cooperative equilibrium instead of just uh, paying attention to just domestic variables when they're setting uh, monetary policy. So that's my rendition of the traditional view. What I like about that particular rendition is we only have to change one thing to get to the alternative view. So I'm going to do that in the second part of this talk. Let me just get a drink of water here before I get to the tough part. So there is a literature on the alternative view uh, and some of my own work. So I'm going to kind of disavow my own work, even though I'm presenting it here. Um, this was written before the crisis, but I think it's maybe become more relevant uh, since, the, since the crisis evolved and more relevant in a period of unconventional monetary policy. So here's the alternative view. You just take all the assumptions I just wrote down uh, about the international economy, same, all the same. 
the only difference is that policymakers in at least one country, or maybe a couple of countries, uh, are not following good policy. So that means that at least one of the pol national policymakers does not adjust the degree of policy accommodation more than one for one in response to deviations of inflation from target. That is, at somebody somewhere around the world is not obeying uh, the Taylor principle. Now, what you're saying, if you make that kind of assumption, is that somebody's following suboptimal policy. How reasonable is that? Why should anybody follow suboptimal policy? Why don't they do the, the most optimal thing? But it might be reasonable uh, that some countries are not obeying the Taylor principle in the current circumstance. These are not normal times for monetary policy uh, in the US, or for that matter, in Europe, uh, or the UK, or Japan. And in particular, it's hard to follow or even think about what a Taylor principle would be in the current environment. The Taylor principle was you have to adjust nominal interest rates more than one for one with deviations of inflation from target. What does that mean in an unconventional policy world? And in particular, what does it mean to respond to declines in inflation when policy rate is subject to the zero lower bound? So, what's happening is you're constrained by the zero lower bound. We're trying to substitute with alternative types of policy like QE or forward guidance, but it's not clear that we're doing enough of that or the right kind of policy to actually get back to the Taylor principle to be able to adjust the degree of accommodation in the right way, and especially when inflation's below target. If inflation was skyrocketing or going above target, it would be obvious what to do. You need to raise uh, rates in order to keep that under control. But when inflation is down on the low side, it's not as clear what to do, and we've tried to substitute with uh, unconventional monetary policy. So it might be reasonable to make this suboptimal policy assumption more reasonable than it would have been in the 2000s or the 1990s. Actually, when I first wrote this, I, was, I had in mind Japan. Uh, yeah, I had a mind a three country world uh, where the US was following you know, the Taylor principle, Europe was following the Taylor principle, but Japan was not. And what were the implications of that for uh, global macroeconomic equilibrium? Okay, so suppose you go ahead with this. You maintain all the other assumptions, except that now you suppose some national policymakers do not follow the good policy. What do you get out of that? Well, now the worldwide equilibrium is not unique anymore. Uh, so there isn't a unique outcome where all markets clear and everybody has uh, rational expectations. Instead, there's a whole continuum of possible equilibria, and uh, all of those are consistent with market clearing and rational expectations. So what you can get is that maybe the uh, global economy coordinates on one of these volatile equilibria, and then the observed volatility might be much larger than what you'd get if the key central banks are following more normal policies away from the zero lower bound. So you lose this uniqueness and you get the possibility of lots of volatility as part of an equilibrium outcome in the global economy. So what do we conclude from this alternative view? Well, the problem in the alternative view is that some countries are not following the Taylor principle. And the result is that there's potentially a lot of extra volatility in the global economy and so the key question comes down to, well, is the US following the Taylor principle or not? And that comes down to, well, do you think unconventional policy is effective or not? If unconventional monetary policy is ineffective in the sense that it can't appropriately substitute for the Taylor principle, especially when inflation is below target, then you could get uh, global equilibrium to be overly volatile. So what that would mean is when you're looking at those first four pictures that I showed you, instead of saying that's just business as usual, you would say that's way more volatile than it has to be. So is this reasonable? I think the alternative view might be one way to represent the emerging market criticism of US monetary policy. To get rid of the overly volatile worldwide equilibria, the US would need to make sure that unconventional policies are aggressive enough to replicate the Taylor principle. If you ask me, are we doing that? Is the FOMC doing that? I would say yes, I think they are. Uh, 
And uh, uh, so therefore, I think we're in, in sort of the traditional world. But I admit, there's certainly room for debate. There's the debate on the effectiveness of unconventional monetary policy is all over the map, and reasonable people can disagree about whether this stuff is working or not. So let me just uh, come back to this speech by John Taylor, because my point here is similar to, but not exactly the same as what he's saying. So what he said was, uh, recent policy, monetary policy developments in the US and other advanced economies are a deviation from rules-based policy. For, so for John, it's always got to be the Taylor rule, the Taylor rule. And you're supposed to be following the Taylor rule. And if you're not, you're, you're, uh, you don't have the right monetary policy. And he's interpreting uh, hitting the zero lower bound and doing QE and forward guidance. That's all kind of uh, a deviation from his preferred uh, policy. And then part of his story is that deviations beget deviations uh, so that uh, when one central bank deviates, then this creates incentives for other central banks to also deviate. Pretty soon, everyone's uh, deviating from what would otherwise be optimal policy and you've got a big, inefficient global equilibrium. So this idea is similar in flavor to the one presented here, but I don't have any ideas about uh, central banks sort of feeding back or copying off each other uh, in my story. I just say, if, you, if it's suboptimal, even in one country, if one country's following, uh, not following the Taylor Principle, then the, you, you could get a volatile global equilibrium. All right. So let me wrap up uh, what the point of all this is, it, and there is one. So uh, um, the traditional view, I think, provides a good description of the commentary from many defenders of US monetary policy, including, including myself. That's the conception that most people have in mind uh, when they're saying, I don't think there'd be a lot of gains from trying to coordinate uh, monetary policy in a, very, in a real explicit way. The more radical but less established second view that I described might be one way to uh, talk about emerging, what emerging market commentators are saying in, without changing all the assumptions around about capital mobility and flexible exchange rates. So it just change one thing, and it's, uh, it's that one country, one or more countries are not following uh, Taylor principle. So the difference between these two views is, is essentially a judgment on whether unconventional US policy is effective or not. And effective in this, the way I'm framing this has a very clear uh, uh, description. It means is unconventional policy substituting in a way that, uh, for normal monetary policy in a way that replicates the Taylor principle. If unconventional US monetary policy is quite effective in this sense, then the traditional view is more uh, nearly correct, and the gains from international policy coordination would again be small, and uh, people that want to argue from that perspective uh, would take that point of view. Those that want to say that unconventional policy is ineffective, then the alternative view would be more nearly correct. The global gains from US shifting to better policy might be quite large. I'm a US policymaker. I'm on the FOMC. I think unconventional policy has been uh, aggressive enough to replicate the Taylor principle. But I admit there's a lot of room for debate on this issue. So I'm going to stop there. And thanks for your attention. Well, I'm going to exercise um, my privilege from the podium and ask the first um, uh, two brief questions and while you prepare uh, your list. Um, there are a couple of things that occur to me immediately. I completely agree that um, um, US um, uh, unconventional policy is effective, but what happens if there's another major central bank out there where, who should have been uh, uh, following unconventional policy um, but didn't, or whose unconventional policy was ineffective. Now, do you mean I, the central bank whose name must not be mentioned? I'm going to mention <laughs> one. <laughs> so, for example, in Europe, where there, <laughs> where there are some constraints. So, my first question would be what does that do to your framework? 
um, because in, in, in a way, a lot of people might argue that the Fed has led the way in trying to um, deal with these extraordinary circumstances, uh, deal with the uh, lower bound problem uh, and so forth, but hasn't always been matched elsewhere. So that's one question. Do you want me to answer that? Yes, why not? Okay. So uh, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, uh, the way I had originally thought about this when I worked on it with my co-author, Artie Singh, was that it, it, I had this three country thing in mind. Uh, Europe was following a Taylor Principle. US was following a Taylor Principle. Japan was stuck in, uh, uh, mired in, in problems and was not following a Taylor Principle. And then what does the global equilibrium look like in that scenario? And the answer was, the global equilibrium inherits the worst properties of the worst central bank. So it's very pessimistic in this regard, in, the, in what you're saying. So uh, that's, that's true. And now you've got, uh, since we wrote the paper, now you've got multiple countries at the zero uh, lower bound. And they're doing, uh, reacting to being at the zero bound in, a, in differential ways. Some are very aggressive in following various types of unconventional policy, and some are not. Uh, and the, you know, as far as the model goes, and there are limits to how much interpretation you can put on a model, but uh, it, w it would basically say that whoever's doing the least amount, the bad properties in induced by that guy are being inherited by everybody, and then we're all exposed to extra volatility because uh, the one guy isn't doing enough. So okay, and there's just a little bit more on this. You could have a many country world uh, and you can control for size in this world. So if a country that's not obeying the Taylor Principle is really small, that would cause global macroeconomic equilibrium to be volatile, but those effects would be really small because it's a very small country. So what you're really worried about is when the big guys are not obeying the Taylor Principle. That's, that's what comes out of this. May I offer the conclusion, uh, a conclusion? Okay. That when people blame the Fed, they should have been blaming the ECB. I'd be happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the logical uh, consequence of yeah. that particular interpretation. Yeah. My second question was um, thinking ahead a little, uh, using the same framework. Uh, and I wanted to ask you if you had any comments on the debate about where the neutral funds rate. Suppose we are able to move away from the lower bound. That's been a lot of the debate. We're hoping the economy is improving uh, enough that we can move away eventually from the lower bound. But there's quite a lot of debate about whether the neutral, so-called neutral policy rate may have changed as a result of the crisis or maybe temporarily or persistently lower than, say, it was before. I believe there's the whole headwinds uh, debate. So it might be helpful to sort of just just have your thoughts on whether that, going forward, yeah. then goes into this framework. Um, not, In other words, not just at the lower bound. Yeah, uh, so I have a, a, a spiel about this, which I, some of you might have heard before, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, so we've got these dots in 2016, uh, and they're kind of, they look low. And what that means is that even though the output gap in the US is supposed to be closed by 2016, and inflation would be at target, it looks like if you look at our charts, it looks like the funds rate would still be below the sort of long run uh, funds rate. And there are three stories uh, that are being told about this. And um, so I'm going to put all three of them on the table. By the way, my own dot is up at 4%. So it's, uh, I don't have the funds rate below the long run level once the output gap is closed and once inflation's at target. So there are three stories, though, that you could tell on, on why the funds rate would still be below uh, its normal level, even though these gaps are closed. One would be the headwind story, that there's still going to be something else going on in the US economy at that point. And uh, uh, this, this is probably the most mysterious story of the three. Uh, there might be shocks out there, or there might be lingering problems out there. But, uh, and that's why the funds rate would still be low. What's hard about that story is uh, 
uh, why, whatever these headwinds are, why aren't they affecting the output gap and why aren't they affecting the deviation of inflation from target? Why is it that you could have the output gap being closed and inflation be at target and still have some kind of headwinds? But that's one story. Uh, so uh, you can talk about headwinds and many commentators have talked in terms of, of headwinds. That's one. Another story is the Woodford story. So uh, Mike Woodford from Columbia University has been uh, a great uh, architect of modern monetary theory. And his recommendation is when you're at the zero bound, the way you uh, fix that is that you promise to stay at the zero bound even longer past the time when you would otherwise be raising rates. So you could interpret the 2016 dots in a Woodford way. You could say, well, funds rate will still be below uh, its normal level, but that's because the FOMC has to make up for the time when it was constrained by the zero bound and that it all comes out eventually. Uh, but the way policy works when you're at the zero bound is that you stay at the zero bound even longer because you, you need to make up for the time when you were constrained. That would be another story uh, that you could tell that's kind of a more technical and uh, theoretical kind of story, and it's not been as popular, I don't think, uh, except Mike Woodford, it's very popular with him, uh, but uh, it's not been as popular. The third story, I think, is probably the best one, uh, which is that real interest rates have been low uh, around the world uh, for quite a while, all through the last decade, let's say, and it looks like that's a very persistent thing and that seems to have to do with global factors. Uh, Chairman Bernanke at one point uh, uh, put forward a global savings glut type of theory, but if, even if you don't like that theory, for whatever reason, uh, real interest rates have just been quite low in the last 10 years. That looks like a very persistent thing going forward. So what's gonna happen in 2016 and, and those years out in that, that time frame? probably real interest rates will still be pretty low so when you're trying to get to a neutral federal funds rate, you should add 2% inflation to a lower number for the real interest rate, 1% or something like that, and you would get a lower neutral federal funds rate. So I think that's probably the most credible of the three stories. And uh, I think some people that tell a headwind story might have a real interest rate story in mind when they're, when they're talking about it. So that's probably more than you want to hear about this, but... Uh, 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 I do think that's an important issue and, and one that needs to be debated going forward. Just before we leave that issue, um, um, what's the difference, if you like, between the Woodford story and the idea that perhaps you should, the, the Federal Reserve should be uh, targeting a, an inflation, a, a level of the CPI, and therefore if they fall below that level, they should allow? Is there a, is there a difference or does that bring it? No, it's very similar uh, because... If you look at those models and how they work, they're really all about price level targeting. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it is the idea that you, you, know, you want to return the price level to some price level path. Uh, one comment I would have on that is it depends when you start the price level path. So I like to think of 1995 as the time frame when the US finally got inflation back down to 2% and started adopting a, you know, implicitly adopting a 2% inflation target. So if you draw the price level from 1995 till today, uh, based on a 2% inflation target, we're basically right on that price level. So I interpret that to say that US monetary policy has more or less followed the advice that comes from the, uh, from the new Keynesian literature on what optimal policy would be since 1995. Doing the math in my head very quickly, I can tell you that <laughs> and illustrate your point. If you start from 1992, uh, the, the, uh, core, the P headline PCE is 1.1% below, and core PCE is 4.4% below the 2% inflation target, which illustrates the problem of where you start from. Yes. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, uh, let's open the um, uh, floor to questions. I'm sure there'll be plenty. Um, okay, there are a couple in the front. I think this gentleman uh, wants the first. Yes, Burns from Reverend Howard. Um, from your talk, I get the impression that suppression of volatility is a major policy objective. Um, you could sort of argue that one of the biggest imbalances, particularly in the credit market, occurred in a time of very low volatility. And if you had more volatility, 
there would have been less imbalances accumulated before the financial crisis. Or also the type of volatility we saw in emerging markets last year, they're just symptoms of unsustainable things and the volatility actually had a good result in terms of that good policy steps were taken to address longer term issues which could uh, create much bigger problems. Yep, those are great points. The, um, the kind of volatility that's going on in the models here that I'm talking about is not good. So there would be, in the traditional view, there would be these shocks that would hit the economy and there would be, uh, uh, you know, policy is close to optimal and the equilibrium would be moving around and that would all be to the good. And it would be kind of like you're describing that uh, you wouldn't want to get rid of that volatility because that would be the, the, the normal volatility that's associated with the stochastic equilibrium. But the other view, the alternative view, would say that you're supposed to have this much volatility as part of the normal uh, ebb and flow of supply and demand in the global markets, but instead you've got this much volatility. So it's the excess volatility that you'd want to get rid of. You wouldn't want to get rid of all volatility. You'd want to get rid of the, just the, the excess part that is unnecessary uh, fluctuations. Okay. I think the gentleman here in the front was the second. So, Mr. Bullard, uh, I gather that you don't like price level targeting a la Svensson and you don't like Mike Woodford. How about r hiking the inflation target from 2% to, say, 4%? Uh, I, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't really, uh, you know, it's been suggested quite a bit to, uh, that, that you'd get better outcomes by having more inf higher inflation target. I don't really see what they are. Most of the models say, you know, just name an inflation target and then uh, and then proceed from there so no I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's good there's a question <laughs> at the back here uh, Dr. Buller my name is Gregory Marks I'm quite confident I'm the youngest person here so I find it appropriate to pose this question uh, student loan debt uh, will you be advocating Chair Yellen uses more forceful language in front of Congress, as well as you know stronger language in the uh, FOMC statement. Because from where I sit as a student, I see massive amounts of complacency among my classmates. I see undeclared majors with $100,000 in debt, and they're not aware of, of the cost that will uh, they will incur over their lifetime. And I guess on that note, uh, CPI, if that is a massive uh, expenditure for this generation repaying their student loan debt, why, won't, why isn't uh, the cost structure of universities that have continued to rise, why isn't that included in uh, CPI? Um, I have looked at uh, student loan debt. It's uh, you know on the order of a trillion dollars in the US. Uh, there do seem to be some excesses in that uh, market. I do worry about people uh, taking on too much debt in a complacent fashion or loans being given to people who don't really have a realistic uh, chance to repay that loan and therefore will be saddled with the debt for a long time. Uh, so I see distortions in that market and I don't think it's, uh, it's not good. However, I'm not sure monetary policy can directly affect something as specific as uh, student loan debt and I wouldn't recommend that we go that way, but um, uh, I think Cherry Ellen has commented uh, from time to time, and probably will in the future, about, uh, about student loan debt. As far as um, uh, what's measured in the CPI, uh, the, you know, these price indexes are, price, building a price index is actually a very hard thing. So you know, you're trying to get a very broad swath of goods and services all through the uh, economy. And I think we uh, do as good a job as we can do. But when you really get into it, it's very difficult to, to build uh, price indexes. So you have to think about the um, changes in the substitution and, and income effects. But you also have to think about changes in the nature of goods over time. And uh, so it's, it's actually quite hard to build it, but I think we do the best job that we can in trying to get uh, all a broad array of uh, household costs into those uh, indexes. Another question? There are a couple over that part of the room. 
Yes. Uh, yes, George Long from Lim Advisors. Um, you've talked about, in, in the context of global um, uh, monetary policy coordination, um, U.S., Japan, and Europe, could you talk about China uh, and how that impacts global monetary policy coordination? Because, it, it, first of all, it's, it has a closed capital account. Its domestic interest rate policy is um, distorted. Um, China's also uh, announced over time that they plan to ha move the renminbi to make it a more international reserve currency. So um, that must have a huge impact on global monetary policy coordination, yet it's not talked about very much. Yes, uh, that is a great point. So the, the way the models work, the way I laid them out, is uh, there are these independent countries, there are flexible exchange rates, there's free capital flows, there's independent monetary policy. How does that fit with China? And I, I did try to, uh, when I worked on that paper, I thought about that uh, situation. Uh, to the extent you'd have a country that was pegging to another country, usually what we say is, and if there was capital mobility, then what we would say is that the country that's pegging uh, to the other country is importing the monetary policy from the, uh, from the other country. So if it's Germany and the Netherlands, uh, which it was for many years, then the, for the Dutch, uh, the, the policy was just dictated by the Germans. Um, whether you'd want to go that far and describe that as what's going on between the U.S. and China, I think would be a str maybe a stretch. Uh, you don't have uh, capital mobility, not, certainly not free capital mobility at this point. So I just, I came away thinking it would just, the models that we're talking about probably can't address the China situation uh, coherently. A couple more questions. I think the gentleman back there was first. Dr. Bullard, uh, thanks for your comments, um, both yesterday at the um, Central Bank panel and today. Um, yesterday, you did mention two bubbles, you know, in the U.S. economy, the um, um, NASDAQ bubble and then the mortgage bubble. Um, what, uh, and in the case of the mortgage bubble, it really started to build uh, even after interest rates uh, started to rise. Uh, could you give us some sense as to sort of what antenna the Fed may have to spot, you know, bubbles as they're forming and what tools you may have at your disposal to actually address uh, a bubble, you know, before it bursts the way the last one did? Great. I, I appreciate your mentioning the 2004-2006 period because I think uh, where we are right now with monetary policy is, you know, we're, we're pulling back on QE. Maybe at some point we'll start raising interest rates. So we're kind of not too different from the 2003-2004 period of the last cycle. And what's interesting uh, and a key risk, I think, going forward is that um, uh, it's, it's sort of related to what happened during that period. The bubble was forming, and yet policy accommodation was being removed all during that period. So if you wanted to use monetary policy to do more during that period, you would have had to be faster uh, than the FOMC was at that time. And that's been a widespread uh, criticism of, the, of that tightening uh, cycle. So I think that's a key risk now going forward. I don't see a major bubble right now, but maybe one would form uh, as we're trying to remove accommodation in the years ahead. Uh, be, you know, because that's exactly what happened in 2004, 2006. So I, I probably not being as articulate as I'd like to be on that, but but I do think that's a key risk um, uh, going forward. As far as tools to assess uh, uh, bubble-like behavior, I think we're much much better than we were uh, during that era because we have a new unit at the board that this is all they do the, at the board of governors. They gather a lot of intelligence about different aspects of financial markets. Uh, they try to make assessments about whether there's price misalignment relative to some notion of fundamentals. So I think our radar screen is much better than it was. And uh, uh, I think that's going to give us much better intelligence uh, this time around about developments that might be occurring. So I'm, I, th I think we're much better equipped on that dimension. You know, the question of would we actually do something uh, and what would it be, that's a great question. But at least uh, on the information side, I think we'll be much better than we were. Do, would you like to elaborate very quickly on 
what besides interest rate policy might be under consideration in that? Well, moment? Chairman Bernanke and now Chair Yellen have, you know, they've repeatedly said that the way to deal with uh, uh, asset price bubbles or uh, in a sort of inappropriate pricing in financial markets would be through a macro prudential context and that you would preferably like to leave monetary policy to deal with ordinary macroeconomic uh, concerns. And, but, but I think it's always been a little bit vague as to, well, what would that actually mean? And uh, if you identified a particular corner of financial markets that you felt like was uh, uh, the pricing was inappropriate or way out of line, then, then what exactly would this macro prudential response be? And I think we're living through an era where we're going to learn uh, more about that uh, and what that's going to look like. A couple more questions. Uh, let me just check. Uh, there, I'm going to be fair to this side of the room, and then we'll go over here just because um, there's a gentleman right here, I believe. Hey, Dr. Goulart, the, uh, what are emerging markets supposed to be doing in, in face of unconventional monetary policy. Will it be the counterpart of uh, unlimited liquidity provided uh, via so QE? Would it be on the emerging markets the optimal uh, policy would be capital controls, not letting that inflow of, at the extreme, not letting that inflow of liquidity coming into the markets uh, distorting, uh, creating then potentially damaging outflows at a later stage, as w this has been suggested after May last year. Yeah, I think if uh, a lot depends on whether you go with the first view that I outlined or the second view. If you go with the first view that I outlined and that the volatility that we observe is just the macroeconomic equilibrium in action, then you would not want to use anything like capital controls or anything else because then you'd be distorting uh, the equilibrium from what it's supposed to be and you'd get uh, more, uh, you know, you'd get poorer allocation of resources than what you would otherwise get. And so I think that's been, you know, traditionally been the uh, IMF uh, story about uh, why you want to avoid uh, capital controls. Now, if you take the second view, the second view says there's a lot of extra volatility beyond what that would, that would be associated with the ordinary equilibrium, then you might get to a situation where other measures like, uh, that would control these flows would be sensible and might, de and might uh, uh, deliver you know, a better allocation of resources. But you have to be in a situation where the volatility is sort of extra or, or uh, unnecessary volatility before you can get to that kind of a policy prescription. Okay, we're going to have time for one more question, and I think to, uh, I think over in the back side, so that I'm going to be very arbitrary right at the back. We haven't had a question from the back row yet. Uh, thank you for my last question. Uh, uh, basically, the U.S. is on the path of uh, uh, normalizing the interest rate uh, in the next uh, pretty soon, maybe uh, 18 to 24 months. Uh, how's it going to impact the, uh, you know, the, that rise of the short-term rate will sort of uh, induce the other countries like Euro or Japan to raise rates uh, uh, to maintain a sort of stable exchange rate? Uh, would that create sort of the, you know, significant damage to the global recovery? Um, well, I mean, you think of the, uh, the policies as being independent across countries uh, and responding mostly to domestic concerns, then I wouldn't say that there necessarily has to be uh, any relation between the, the times when various countries would decide to try to normalize their monetary policy. Obviously, uh, Europe, for instance, uh, went in a very different direction from the US uh, over the last five years. I would say, just looking very broadly at what happened in the last five years, huge shock hit the global economy. All the countries go into recession. Everyone comes out of recession. Everyone's growing. Europe and U.S. actually had the same unemployment rate in the fall of 2009, 10%. And then what happened? U.S. continued to recover. Europe went back into recession. So they're up at 12.5% uh, unemployment. We're down uh, below 7% uh, unemployment. So I think the main thing that has happened is that uh, conditions, compared to the crisis itself, 
where the whole global equilibrium moved to, all the countries moved together. Since then, some countries, especially big, or the Euro area in the US, have diverged in different directions. So now they, so they had a double dip recession. We didn't, so I think everything is, just depends on uh, sort of uh, conditions in the particular region or the particular country. You wouldn't have to say that the interest rate cycle is all that linked across countries. Thank you. All right, that thanks was very much. Beautiful, elegant, and very revealing. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot.